Uh, Dr. Yan, I'm so appreciative for you to come on today. The reason we wanted you to have come on, I know that you're really a huge fan of the president's and, and, and since you've, you're here and you're in the asylum program, and hopefully we, we would love you to stay because you've got so many fans throughout the country and throughout the world that just love your bravery and, and love that your family's bravery and standing up to the Chinese Communist Party. Jack, I'll toss it to you, but I think what people would like to know, since they look at you as one of the experts, what should the president be doing now that he's contracted the Chinese Communist Party virus? The CC, he has a CCB virus. What would you be telling the president he should be doing today? Hi, sir. Uh, thank you for having me today. So first, I want to say I hope the president and the first lady could get recover as soon as possible. And I believe that. And the second thing is this virus is not a common virus as we know it before. So all the experience we know to control the virus, control the pa pandemic, actually is based on our experience and knowledge to the other nature origin virus not this one come from the lab and also intends to target human already. So in this way, we cannot get avoid of such pandemics, the third wave, the fourth wave, and also more. And also it's difficult for us to find the efficient vaccine and also efficient drug to do the very good treatment for all the people. Still, we always face to the risk that we have to be exposed into again and again reinfection dangerous. So that's why I can, uh, tell people that if you want to understand the virus, you want to control it, you want to remove the risk, you have to first do the survey investigation and how to do that is to remove the Chinese Communist, uh, Communist Party regime. If not, there is no way for you to do the survey investigation to understand this virus and also to get a better treatment, better prevention for people. Let, let me ask you, we got about a minute here. You got 30 seconds in this block before we got jump to commercial. I want you to stay over. Is there, are you saying you don't believe that we could force our way and get scientists into these labs to report? You think the CCP has got to be taken down first? You don't think there's any way that the world community come together and actually get into the labs and get, get the reports and get the analysis done? It's not because of my thinking or not that we already say it from the beginning to now. Now it's almost one year. The global health face to the hilarious attack and also people all live in a panic and very insecure life because of the virus. The whole scientific world and also WHO and Chinese Communist Party have shown what they have done and what they can do. People will see more if they all give them chance. Dr. Yan, I read this uh, article in The Weekend, you know, I've spoken to you so many times, but one thing I thought was really interesting in this article was your talk of how you had to leave Hong Kong, because I think that's something that would be really interesting for our readers to listen about. You had the first interview with Ludak, and then you were talking to him, and there was a certain point where you realized that you had to get out. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because there's kind of a cloak and dagger aspect to it, and it really highlights the danger that and bravery that people like yourself uh, put yourselves through. So if you could kind of describe how that went down as much as you can. I, our listeners would love to hear it. Okay, so briefly that I was pushed to leave Hong Kong because of the situation. First is because Mr. Wu told me the intelligence that since I have done several months work with him, also anonymous, that to reveal the truth of COVID-19. So Chinese Communist Party already targeted me and they want to make me disappear. The second thing is, since the pandemic become worse and worse all over the world, and also Western people still don't have the right information to understand this virus. So I realized that I have to come out because I may be the only one, also not the, I'm also the first one from inside as scientists and doctor to tell people the fact of COVID-19. So, Based on this, uh, I decided to leave U.S. Uh, leave Hong Kong to U.S. And during that time, because it's hard to make decision, so it takes some time. But when I see danger get uh, more and more close, so I asked to get a ticket. And the Rule of Law Foundation helped me to get a ticket just so the day before I escape. And also the next day when I 
uh, before I go to the airport, I have to pretend to go to work. So I pretend to go to see the doctor in the campus and then turn back home. With the help, I quickly bring a little bit of luggage and also uh, take the car to go to the lab because I keep my passport in the lab in case I cannot bring any luggage. And then I bring my passport, I have to talk to my colleague, talk to my supervisor, Liu Peng, like uh, reporting my work and discuss about the update of my work. And then during lunch time, they thought I go to do the animal work in the individual lab. And I took the car, I get rid of the surveillance camera in the campus and quickly went to the airport. This is so great. I mean, literally, this is cloak and dagger. This is, this is why I think there's a very strong parallel between the Communist Chinese and the USSR. I mean, you look at what it takes to get away from them when they want you, and you begin to understand that there really aren't that many differences. It's almost like there's just different icing on this cake. And, uh, but, wow, I, I loved hearing that. The other thing I wanted that you touched on in that article that I think is so important you worked with a World Health Organization uh, scientist at your lab, and he was well aware of all of your findings concerning human-to-human -human transmission long before the World Health Organization ever admitted to that. Could you touch upon that for us? Okay, so we have a bunch of the top coronavirus and emerging disease experts in the world, and that is well known. So this, uh, this WHO consultant, like, Professor uh, Liu Peng, like Professor Manik Paris, they know the things I get investigated. They know human-to-human -human transmission. What I can tell you is, do you know that Professor Manik actually have been to Wuhan at least twice in January, but in secret. So he still tell the people, in the representative of WHO, even after mid January, that there is no human-to-human -human transmission, right? And these people, they have spent years studying the coronavirus, so they know a lot about this type of the virus. And also as an international bridge between China Com uh, Communist Party and also the world, our WHO reference lab in Hong Kong actually is very hated for people to realize the real connection between China and them. So let me ask you a question, because this is almost like groundbreaking news. You are saying that a scientist who works for the World Health Organization, Pierce, that he actually went secretly to Wuhan twice in January and never revealed that information to the world, especially when you consider that the World Health Organization is a public body? Yeah, Professor Malik Pierce at least went to Wuhan twice in secret. This is confirmed, but only known by the very, very small group of people, basically like the secretary and me and his closest uh, assistant, so who is my husband at that time. Hey, uh, Jack, uh, I'm really, I mean, I got, just, just, just real quickly, uh, while well, we got your doctor, uh, the, the treatment that you think President Trump should be doing uh, today, what, what, what is the, uh, give us your recommendations, understand you're I not a, uh, you're not a physician. Strongly recommend the cocoa tail treatment. Uh, you can refer to Dr. Delanco's therapy. That is uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine plus azimacin and also the zinc. And of course, you have to have other support treatment and individual treatment uh, to the physical condition. But the cocoa tail, the treatment therapy is very important. Also for people okay. close to him, uh, I recommend the high risk prevention protocol. Dr. Yan, so we've got about a minute. Got about a minute left. Uh, Dr. Fauci and others at the CDC would say you're a wing nut, like Dr. Zelensky and Dr. Rish at Yale by prescribing that. What do you have to say to them? They are Chinese Communist Party's good friend, close friend, and also close friend to Malik Perez. Ask Dr. Fauci; he knows, and I know. Doc, Dr. Yan, thank you so much. It's a great honor to have you on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. So, Jack, Jack, I want to go back to you in Fog City, Midge. I want to talk to the doctor that was on the steps of, about the doctors on the steps. Jack, why is this still controversial about hydroxy? 
You've got Dr. Yan, who knows it better than anybody coming from Hong Kong. You know, she was a fact witness over there. She worked at the best lab in the world. Why are we still having this discussion when the president of the United States now has the CCP virus? Why is there some confusion between really the Trump government on the administrative state side and what experts know throughout the world? Well, you know, here's another thing that Donald Trump can do to, to sort of solve some of this problem. Donald Trump has the right to be prescribed any FDA medicine that is approved in conjunction with consultation with his doctor, right? There's no bar against that, no matter what uh, the governor of Michigan or anyone else says. So I think it would be great if Donald Trump just went out, took the Zelenko protocol, said he was doing it, was very open about it. I think it would uh, give a lot of inspiration and strength to doctors out there who've been cautious about prescribing this medicine. One thing that's a huge tell in the last week, we had that study that came out on Monday where they tried to disprove the prophylactic use of this medicine. But remember, the reason we stopped using this medicine was because it caused heart arrhythmia and it was going to cause you to have a heart attack. That test that was done at, uh, I believe at Emory, they they did, uh, no, it wasn't Emory, I apologize, but they gave people 600 milligrams per day for eight weeks. This is a very high level. This is higher than the level that we give to a lupus patient, and there's no problem with the heart. What happened to the heart okay, problem? Wasn't that the reason that we stopped using this drug? We're going to take a quick break. We're going to get back with some more heroes from China.